All right. So today I wanted to point out while I was at Great North Woods this last weekend with Chris, he was getting texts from you all asking what the exam is. And I mean, I generally say there's no such thing as a stupid question, and I believe that. I guess perhaps because I used to go over the syllabus in class, but now that I just put it on D2L, I assume that everybody looks at it. There is a schedule on D2L, and when is the exam? Like, he was... Then it got to think, like, is it supposed to be Tuesday? Because then I'm confused, because I was pretty certain that it was Thursday. So, like, it's in the syllabus. Dr. Gincha has on his desk a little a little magnet that says it's in the syllabus. So, um, now what's not in this, or what is in the syllabus that's incorrect, and I want to point this out, is that it says that today we should be covering direct marketing. We're obviously not going to make it through that. So we're going to make it through magazines and newspapers, which means we'll only go through chapter 12 on this exam. If you feel cheated by that, you let me know, and I will create a very special exam just for you that will include both chapters 13 and 14. And this also goes from online class. I did send them an email, but I'm also mentioning this. I'm only going to cover what I go through in class because I upload the videos for the online students to be able to watch this in case it helps them understand the content. And so it wouldn't be fair for me to sort of have a split in the classes. And so I, I, I'm going to um, stick to that. So for those of you in the online world, if you're watching live or afterwards, you'll only go through chapter 12. Again, if you feel cheated in the online because you've already read ahead and looked at so unless you want, I'll create a special exam for you in the online class as well, and I'd be happy to create a special exam for those of you in here. You're not going to like that exam if I have to create a special exam. Um, it will consist of mostly essays on those two chapters, and you're probably going to so, be very, very unhappy with that. So I would, but you're welcome to tell me that you're upset. Um, I thought I would ask how many of you are graduating this May. How many how many of you will be back next year? How many of you will be back next year? He's a baby. One, two. What do you mean a baby? I'll be back. <laughs> You'll be back until December, is that yeah. right? Yeah. So I have two more full semesters. Okay. So I'm going to put Chris on the spot. I'm going to ask him to tell you, for those of you who are continuing on with us, about his experience going to Great North Woods this last in school. We will get through this class presentation in record breaking time about all of the fun things he did and why you want to become a member of the team, or at least join AMA and think about going to the competition. So Chris, you have the floor for as long as you want to talk about oh, wow. okay. great work for us. The uh, sales team in AMA. Give us your life story for your time. Okay. Uh, no, Just so remember that I, I said we wouldn't take up the whole hour, so you can have some time to study. But go ahead. Um, so really the biggest thing about the sales team, the competitions are a really good time, right? Because if you have a competitive spirit like I do, it's a really good chance to like keep that going. Um, you get to prepare, you get to practice. Um, and it's one of those things where when you come back from a competition like that, whenever it comes to like any sort of other presentation, it's nowhere near as nerve wracking as it is before that first uh, role play, right? Like there's just nothing like it. So whenever you come back and you have to present something to a class, it's like not even in the same, like, yeah, it's, it's just not the same. Um, and it's the most realistic, like I interned at Gartner this summer and I was doing sales and it was the most realistic thing you could do to prepare. Uh, so by joining the sales team um, and getting that experience, you're able to not only prepare for a job in sales, um, one of the biggest things is making connections. Um, so at the career fair, I talked to 12 companies this weekend <coughs> at ICS last year I came back with just like a stack of cards because I was literally talking to every company I could um, and you know if you have a LinkedIn you can you know connect with them there and stuff like that and I've also made friends that I you know stay in, you know stayed in touch with um, so I think the biggest benefit um, overall is just the preparation for the future with the career fair and then um, as well for the future with the experience it gives you in the world so definitely try out, definitely give it a go, um, see what you can do, and have fun. Okay, thanks. I appreciate the shameless plug for my program, because it's, uh, it's important to us that we're growing. I will tell you that 
for SAT to, for those of you who are just marketing majors and not sales majors, um, you should think about a sales minor. Your first jobs will probably be in sales. No matter what you do, you're probably going to have your first job in sales. And we are currently set, I think next year with the number of recruitments that we've gotten this year, the number of professional sales majors will outnumber the number of marketing majors that we have in the department. So we are definitely becoming a, a sales department, and that's that's our strong focus in this department. Not a general marketing degree isn't great, and it's not valuable. It is. It's obviously you know a lot more valuable than I don't know political science or sociology or psychology or any of those. So it's um, it's a good degree program. But sales is definitely <laughs> most of you will come out and, and have that first job in sales. And this is an opportunity to really practice those skills. You have an access to companies that want to hire you. We don't have uh, any of our sales majors or minors that don't get jobs coming out of this of this program. So that's another thing that you might want to think about. Also, we're like good. Like our coaches are good. Yeah, we've got, got a good, we've got a good program. program. Yeah, we do have a good program. So we need to talk about magazines and newspapers today. I will switch to what? Uh, chapters. I guess seven. I didn't cover the last time, right? So it will be seven, which will be establishing objectives for budgeting. Yeah, I put that on this one. So it'll be seven through 12. Chapter 7 through 12 on exam 2. So magazines and newspapers. For a long period of time, obviously, for most of our marketing history, uh, print was the dominant form of advertising. It was really the only form of advertising until the uh, 20th century. But it is obviously undergone it's undergone radical changes as a result of the internet so for more than two centuries print was the dominant form of advertising um, but it's not been kind the past decade your text tells you it has not been kind to print newspapers across the nation are going broke and this is actually problematic for a number of reasons the newspaper in Guthrie, for example um, my hometown is, I think, about on the verge of bankruptcy because people aren't advertising in newspapers anymore. There's this guy who is a, he's a by God philanthropist, and he has created this site that has really taken away a lot of the revenues that newspapers got. His name is Craig, and anybody know what his website is? Craigslist, yeah, I mean, it's free. You can post those classified ads. Newspapers used to have lots and lots and lots of classified. That was that was one of their biggest revenue makers was classified advertising. And people actually went to the classified ads to find all kinds of things like cars and used uh, furniture and fixtures. And now anymore, that's all gone. I mean, Craig has is, Craig is really, really replaced it. For a lot of people who are not internet savvy and don't know about everyone in here, I'm sure has used Craigslist or looked at Craigslist. It can be kind of a creepy site. It's become less creepy in, in the last few years as they've done away as a result of uh, some litigation that's happened. They've done away with some of the personal services ad sectors that they used to have um, because they got in trouble for being contributorily infringing on like prostitution uh, the statute so um, but Craig is a philanthropist and gives it to you for free unless you're selling I think real estate within certain geographic markets and then there was something else that he's actually charged for in order to maintain and Craig no longer I don't think Craig is actually the one who's running the site anymore but, yeah you can't sell animals so that's that's been one that's been oh yeah I think you can I think you're you have to say that it's, you can give them away, but I don't think they'll, I, I mean, so people, they don't police it, but you're not supposed to sell Facebook animals. Does. Facebook does police the animal sales. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Unless you join like a private group. So my German Shepherd has that piece, so I, I'll join the market there. And you can't, like, put, I'm not gonna put on the market, so you have to join like, a private group. And then you puppy and the long page. There's, long I think there's 22 yeah. in Oklahoma. I joined everything else. <laughs> So that has not been kind, obviously, to newspapers because that has been a huge source of
the brownie. And so they're going broke. We still have a paper in Guthrie, <coughs> but it's no longer, it actually at one point in time was printed in Guthrie. It's not. Even the Daily Oklahoma, which used to be the most expensive newspaper in the country and was called the worst newspaper in the country, by the way, by the Columbia Journalism Review, is experiencing extreme financial difficulties. And they don't, you know, they have this huge tower out here on Broadway Extension as a result of the fact that they have way cut back. They've moved out of that, that tower where they used to have all the printing presses, which had that long portion of it, is now gone. The paper, I understand, is now actually printed in Tulsa and then brought uh, to Oklahoma City. And so papers are having a lot of problems. Magazine subscriptions, likewise, are way down. Uh, people have gotten used to one of the things that's a challenge is that they're trying to actually, there was this idea that information wants to be free, and scholars wrote about this, that information wants to be free. And online largely was, and now newspapers and magazines are trying to say, well, we're going to charge for content. And most people are having a hard time, even people like me who are news junkies, are not really willing to pay for that content. If you want to subscribe to the New York Times, the Washington Post, they, they have premium subscriptions if you want to see all their content. And I'm just not willing to do it because I can get most of my news off of CNN for free or MSNBC or NBC News. The television networks have that. And so that is affecting things like magazine subscriptions and newspaper subscriptions. Um, but nonetheless, they are still an important part of life. And particularly for people who are not necessarily media savvy, magazines and newspapers are still uh, a critical outlet to those people for uh, people who are traditionalists, that generation that uh, are your grandparents, or maybe for some of you, your great grandparents. They still like magazines. A lot of them still read newspapers. They actually do pick up the newspaper every day. And um, so it's still an important part, and it's still an important consideration in developing an integrated marketing communication plan. So the role and value of newspapers and magazines, one of the things that's nice about them is that they allow for the presentation of detailed information. You cannot give a lot of detailed information in a 30-second spot on television. And of course, it goes away. Whereas you can provide readers with more information about products in an ad, in a newspaper or a magazine. The text tells you that about 70% of adults still read a newspaper in print or online each week. And whether or not you get it online or print is largely going to be dependent on what? Age group you're in. It's largely going to be dependent upon age group. So there are still lots of people that are those traditionalists that actually want to pick up the paper. I don't know why you want to do that. I don't want to do it because newspapers have what? Ink and they get all over your little hands. It used to be if you were wealthy, you had a, uh, a manservant who would actually iron the paper because it sets the print on there so it doesn't get all over your little hands. But it, uh, it's, it's kind of messy. I hate newspapers, but I do read online and I read the news. And so, um, but I won't subscribe, so that's one of the challenges. If you've got people like me who have the ability and can afford to subscribe and won't, that's one of the challenges that newspapers and magazines are facing. Um, major papers still reach a very broad target audience. So major papers and things like the Washington Post, the New York Times, even the Daily Disappointment or the Daily Liar, as the Columbia Journalism called the Daily Oklahoman or the Daily Prayer, still reaches a large uh, target audience. Specialized papers read specialized markets. So that is one of the things that you can do. You can really get some segmentation um, using print media. So that's one of the things that they're valuable, another valuable thing for them. So magazines, your text tells you, and it's absolutely wrong, just clearly wrong here. Your text tells you that magazines are the most, this is a direct quote, most specialized of all advertising media. Wrong, just clearly wrong. Because there are websites now that are clearly more specialized and more, more directed. So I'm, I'm going to say that that's just wrong. Um, text, students ask me, and they put this in my student reviews from time to time, why are you using a text that you disagree with so vehemently? Well, because I can't write every, I've written a textbook, it takes a long time, I can't write a textbook for everything I teach, and there's no perfect text, so there's the answer, so you don't have to put that in my student day questions. I have to use a textbook of some kind, um, I'll just preempt that little criticism right now, because there's not one that, that meets all of my, you know, not, not every author can be as perfect as I am in my textbook, which is just 100% absolutely accurate. 
classification of magazines. So there are consumer magazines and Cantor Media SRDS uh, classifies 2,700 consumer magazines into 80 classifications. So you've got things like news magazines. What's that? What's a news magazine? The Wall Street Journal is a paper. What's a news magazine? Oh, magazine. I'm sorry. Uh, time. Time. Newsweek. Newsweek is a news magazine. Is Rolling Stone more entertainment? It would be. I think it could be a news. It could be classified as a news magazine or a specific, you know, sort of genre, okay. which would be music news. Men's magazines, things like Men's Health, sports magazines, women's magazines. Um, so there are 80 classifications, and obviously I would expect you to know that, for example, all of the all of the classifications. But just to give you an idea of the breakdown that you can get, consumer magazines represent the major portion of the industry in the United States. So that's things like what, oh, you know, Vanity Fair, those are consumer mags that are read by a lot of people. Um, they also have farm publications, and there are nine classifications of farm publications. So those are things like. Cattlemen's for the beef industry. Um, there are ones for specific regions like Iowa farmer. Business and health uh, is another classification. Advantages of magazines, they have a high degree of selectivity. So obviously, if you're advertising in men's health, you can, I mean, your products can be tailored largely to issues that involve men and their health or men's fitness. Are you going to see advertisements, for example, in men's fitness for breast cancer screening? Probably not. Although, technically, can men get breast cancer? Yeah, they can. Yeah, they can. They can actually get breast cancer. It's just not as prevalent. But you are going to see things <laughs> like for prostate health and stuff like that. So you've got selectivity, specific targets. A good advantage of magazines is the reproduction quality. Unlike newspapers, which are largely, with the exception of like USA Today, are largely still black and white, you do have good reproduction quality. So you can use color. You have a lot of creativity. So you've got gate folds. What are gate folds? How many of you have taken a, a magazine that had a scent? So that's another thing that you'd have scented ads. And you pull open the gate fold on it to get the scent. So scented ads, you can have pop-ups, you can have bleed pages. Bleed pages are ones that go all the way, they don't have a margin. It has a long lifespan. That's the nice thing about magazines. They have a long lifespan. And that was tradition, that was uh, especially true in the past. I've noticed that more and more you used to go to doctor's offices, and because it used to be that you would sit at a doctor's office. I can remember when I was a kid growing up, I would always try to get the first appointment of the day or the first appointment after lunch if the first appointment wasn't available because you would sit in doctor's offices because of scheduling and because of insurance requirements where they can only spend about five minutes with you. The amount of wait time that people actually spend in doctor's offices has shrunk. But because they were historically, you'd wait for long periods of time. If you had a doctor's appointment one day, most people would take off the entire day because they knew that unless they got the first appointment, they were likely to be there all day long because doctors were notoriously bad at not understanding how to schedule patients. That's no longer true. But people would sit in doctor's offices before we had this device that was attached to our hand constantly and actually thumb through magazines. And so they would be maybe several months old because people that worked at the doctor's office would bring in their magazines. People actually subscribed to them. I don't, I don't actually subscribe to any magazines anymore. But people did, and they would bring them to the doctor's office, and they would have a long lifespan. So that was uh, an advantage. Prestige. You can, have, you can have an effect in that if the magazine has prestige and the editorial content is prestigious, that can have a halo effect for the advertiser in terms of believability. The consumer's receptivity and engagement, particularly because they were targeted, consumers are more receptive. So if you are, for example, my brother is a fly fisherman. I don't know why. I, I find it horribly boring. Anybody else like to fly fish? Actually, you like to fly fish a lot. Relaxing. Jesus. 
Uh, yeah, and it just, it's just boring. Like, I, 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 I just can't. Remember. But my brother loves to do this. So he reads magazines or he's like, he's building streams. And they you know there's all these different flies. Uh, he buys all kinds of products from that so that he can tie his own flies. That's another, I just cannot imagine anything more boring than sitting there looking under a magnifying glass and tying some stupid fly. But he likes to do it. So, you know, obviously the engagement, so you're engaged with the, the activity or the content like the building stream or fly fisher. There's a, there's actually a magazine called, I think fly fisherman that he gets. And so you're engaged with it and you're going to look at the, the ads that are in that. You're not going to see ads in fly fisherman for things like, I don't know, you know, treadmills, right? You'll see that in men's health, but you, you won't see it. And so you're actually engaged and you're, you're, you're wanting to find products and things like that that, that uh, are relevant. And so consumer engagement risks with receptivity are really high. There are services that go along with a lot of ad, uh, a lot of magazines, for example, merchandising staffs that call on trade intermediaries. Um, you can do split runs. So for example, in a lot of magazines, they will have they will divide it out by various regions. So if you're interested in you know sort of sports, um, Sports Illustrated, for example, will have split runs a lot of times in their football uh, series where they cover you know obviously in Dallas they're going to do what they're going to have Cowboys. We just got back from Wisconsin. What are they going to have up there? Now? Green Bay, right? So you can have that kind of selectivity. They did it. We had one kid who came back with a cheese head hat. Oh, yeah, see, right. right. They were giving um, away. always one. Yeah. He got he got a cheese head hat. Always one. Disadvantages the magazine. Obviously, the cost uh, varies according to the size of the audience. Um, they have limited reach and frequency, so they have thin penetration. Unlike newspapers, which reach a lot of people, you're, you're more selective, but it's uh, thin penetration. They have a long lead time. Usually magazines are published. How often, for example, is Fly Fisherman published? I don't know. I, 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 don't, I think once a month. Is, you know, there's 12 issues a year, which means you have to sort of plan. So there's that long lead time. If you're advertising, for example, one of the biggest ones for fashion was, of course, Vogue. If you're advertising in Vogue, how thick is the Vogue magazine? What is the what is the big Vogue? What's the biggest Vogue magazine? One that everyone wants to read. Anybody know? Vogue USA. Which which edition? <laughs> who's the who's the editor of um, the point I would start looking this up. Anna Winter. Anna Winter. Pretty white was slow. I know, I was in the mind alone. What is Anna Winter no, known for? It's kind of interesting. I watched a whole special on her. One of the girls in my PhD marketing class, her whole focus in marketing was on luxury marketing. She was very shallow and pretentious. Um, it's like the devil wears Prada. Well, that that is who they modeled uh, that character on after was Anna Wintour. She goes to the runway shows, and what is Angela Anna Wintour known for? International fashion icon. Yeah, she's known, but what's she known for? Is she she's been at the fashion shows? Sunglasses. She wears sunglasses at the fashion shows. Why? So you, can't tell, so you can't tell what her expression is. And so I think the biggest, the biggest um, edition of Vogue, I think, is what they call the fall fashion, and it's huge. It's it's really thick. It's a thick edition of Vogue, and so you've got a lot of clutter and competition in there. Magazine circulation and readership, the Alliance for Audited Media audits consumer and farm publications. Um, they look at things like readership, total audience, uh, in that pass along audience, so how many people take it and put it in the doctor's office or pass it on to friends and total audience. Purchasing space in magazines, uh, it depends on where you go. If you're, are you the 
preferred positions. So what are preferred positions in the magazines or whether you're not, or whether you're willing to just accept where they put you in that. So if you're in the Vogue fall fashion, I think it's the fall fashion. Um, and they did an entire special on her and I watched it uh, and how they came up with the fall, the fall uh, fashion magazine. <laughs> Um, are you on the first cover? What's the first cover? According to your text, what's the first cover? It should be obvious. The cover. It's the cover. What's the second cover? The inside of the cover. The inside of the cover. The third cover is that inside back, and the fourth is the outside back. The future. It's difficult times for the magazines, and many have gone out of business or they're on the ropes. A lot of them are really, really suffering. Why? Because of the internet and people are not necessarily willing to pay for those subscriptions on the internet. So it's gonna be interesting to see. Now, I don't know, will that trend continue or will people go back? I mean, one of the things that is happening that I am noticing is there is nostalgia particularly among your generation and the generation after you, which we have not yet named, but has actually entered the workforce. I guess it's generation post-millennial or something. I don't know what we're going to call them. Extreme selfish. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Extreme narcissism. But there is a huge nostalgia for stuff. So what's one of the things... I never thought it would come back, but it's making a comeback, and they're actually re-releasing stuff on this historic technology. Records. Records, yeah. Vinyl is oh, actually oh, making a comeback. Record players are actually being produced. The bar that we were sitting in after the competition in the hotel had a record player and they actually use it. And there's a record store <coughs> that's popped up right across the <coughs> hotel. And so that's one of the things. So I don't know. Will people go back to sort of that nostalgia for? One of the things we know is that if you actually touch, one of the things that you should do is how many of you actually buy the book for your classes? You probably should rather than just read online, even though you can now highlight and text or highlight and um, copy text and put in stuff and do notes. You actually retain more if you touch it. And it's about a lot of, it's using more than just one or two senses. It's actually about the feel of the paper. And so I don't know, there may be a movement back towards, particularly your generation, actually liking to feel things again. And why is it that you remember books more if you read a book uh, in paper? Well, it's there's a smell to the paper, to the print, particularly if it's an older book. Um, feeling it, actually turning the pages, making notes in the margins. So I'm not sure. So the future, um, a lot of them have gone out of business, but there may be, again, particularly with your generation younger, having this sort of nostalgic uh, view of stuff, a return to uh, magazines that actually wanted uh, print pubs. Did you used to subscribe to magazines yourself? I did. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. why don't you subscribe to like the online version? Like, say you subscribe to the New York Post or Time Magazine. I'm just not that. I'm not that passionate about it. I, mean, I, I can so I can much. get most of the. I mean, most of the things that I'm really passionate about, I you know I can get the information without subscribing to the magazine. So I like, I love my boat and I love horses and I yeah. used to subscribe to a lot of horse magazines and stuff like that. But a lot of that you can get online. online. I mean, you get the content for free. So. And I bet it'd be cheaper for the cut costs and do ads online. Newspapers, like magazines, they're increasingly being read online, and you have different types. You have dailies found in most cities and large towns. So one of the things that's happening is, like I said, in my hometown, the newspaper is on the rocks in Guthrie. They've had to sell their building. They had a huge building in downtown Guthrie, a very pretty building. They've had to sell it. They now outsource the, the actual printing of it. Um, they're no longer publishing every day. I think they've stopped publishing um, on Fridays and Saturdays. They may, they may have stopped publishing on Sunday as well. Um, in a lot of smaller towns or sub suburbs, you'll have weekly newspapers, things like the Gazette in Oklahoma City is a weekly newspaper. And I think the Gazette is on its way out, I think, as well. That used to be, that was one when 
my business first started, that was where we exclusively advertised. That's what really set us off was we started an ad called How to Plan a Murder in the Oklahoma Gazette, and it just totally booked us. But we don't have to advertise there anymore. We get all of our promotions through doing social media. And when we don't, we don't pay anything in advertising anymore. There are national newspapers like USA Today. The Wall Street Journal obviously started out in New York, New York but it's a national publication. Uh, the Washington Post, the, uh, the Times are all national newspapers. And then there are special audience papers like Marketing News. And you would think as a marketer, I agree, marketing news ad. <laughs> I do, I, I, I lie to you. I do subscribe to a magazine, but it's only because I have to belong to AMA and I get it. I get the AMA magazine, but I don't actually read it. I usually pitch it. <laughs> Wouldn't want to know anything about my job. So types of newspaper ads, you can have display that are found throughout the paper, generally used illustrations, headlines, and other visuals. Classified ads, these are dying, again, because good old Craig has allowed us to, to do this much more efficiently and reach a larger audience. And then special ads and inserts, things like grocery stores a lot of times put their coupons, no special ads and inserts in the newspaper. The nice thing about those is that you can tailor them. So for example, if you go to the Daily Oklahoman, they have different sections for different parts of the city, because obviously, a coffee house like Hoboken and Guthrie is going to appeal only to people in the northern part of the city, and they don't have uh, they don't have locations in the south, and so they could actually have geographic with the ad, even the city um, inserts and different editions. So the advantages of newspapers: you have high market penetration, particularly if you are selling those goods that are attractive to. Traditionalists, they still like to get, they still learn about a lot of those consumer packaged goods and things like that through the newspaper. So you have high market coverage, particularly for your older population. You have a lot of flexibility. You can generally change your ads if you run out of stuff or you want to change. You can do that fairly quickly because newspapers are oftentimes printed or published every day or weekly. You can have a lot of geographic selectivity. As I said, for example, the Daily Oklahoman has a North End, or they have a North End in Edmond section. They have a South Oklahoma City. They have a Norman edition. So you can have geographic selectivity. Obviously, if you're advertising um, for products that are sold you know, from national companies but are, are targeted, what does Yamaha produce? Well, they produce all kinds of sports, uh, sporting kinds of equipment like wave runners they obviously you know in newspapers in minnesota where we came from this last weekend in wisconsin they actually have ads in their newspapers there for things like snowmobiles we don't have any ads for snowmobiles in oklahoma because did you use a snowmobile probably not the reader involvement and acceptance is high uh, in the past, many consumers purchased a newspaper simply because of the advertising you think. For years and years and years, when the Daily Oklahoma, when I actually bought the Daily Oklahoma, I cared nothing. I am not a Republican. I think the Daily Oklahoma, it was, it was the most conservative newspaper in the country. It was a horrible publication. The Columbia Journalism Review said it was the worst paper in the, in the nation. It had the largest circulation, though, by the way, at one point in time of conservative newspapers because people who lived outside of Oklahoma knew it was so conservative when the Gaylords ran it that they would actually buy it. They would subscribe to it in places like Denver, Colorado, and they had a huge subscription base. Um, but I would actually buy the Daily Oklahoman before the age of the internet when I actually enjoyed going to movies. I can't stand to go to movies anymore. I just can't invest that amount of time. It's just too annoying. My mother and my aunt still like to go to movies. If I can't they are released almost instantly to home video, so I don't get it. But back before video, before movies were released, I actually did enjoy going to movies, you know, when they actually still pop popcorn and it was kind of an interesting experience. I bought the Daily Oklahoma every week, at least the Sunday, to get that, you know, what was going on in terms of the movie schedule and various events and concerts and things like that that were happening. And so um, a lot of people actually did. I was one of those that just purchased the paper, just to figure out 
what was going on in terms of events in the Sunday lifestyle or life, lifestyle section. Um, newspapers offer, also offer a lot of services. Uh, many papers offer merchandising services and special programs to their, uh, to their advertisers, which can be attractive. <laughs> the disadvantages of newspapers, unlike magazines, there is poor reproduction quality. And newsprint generally is cheap, so it bleeds. They have extremely short lifespans. Unlike magazines, which you would see in doctor's offices, no keeps the paper once it's, a, you know, they throw it away. Unless, of course, you're featured in it. There's a lack of selectivity. You can, you can selectively publish by geography, but there's not a lot of selectivity in terms of demographics for most of these papers. And obviously, you have a lot of clutter. Purchasing newspaper space, general versus local. So a lot of national advertisers will buy space, and uh, we'll get it in multiple newspapers versus local advertisers. The rate structure, there's something called the standard ad unit. The Oklahoman at one point in time was the most expensive paper in the nation to advertise in. That's no longer the case. It's still pretty expensive. It's still expensive, but it's not as expensive as it once was. And it's not the paper that it once was. It's a very thin publication. I mean, the Oklahoman, because it reached so many of the conservative base for so many years, it used to be a really thick paper, and it was thick with ads because a lot of products, particularly things like sportsman's products and stuff like that, that appealed to that conservative base were advertised in that. And so um, they, had a, they had a very high rate structure. Um, you have flat rate, open rates, where you have discounts that are actually available. Uh, the run of the paper affects the cost. The ad placement, are you willing to accept any page? When we advertised in the Daily Oklahoma, we actually wanted to be, for years when my, when my company advertised, we wanted to be in that weekend special because that's what people were looking for. Paying for preferred positions or a combination of those is possible. The future of newspapers. I put a big question mark here because I think it's really, really uncertain. A lot of small towns are gonna, gonna just be without a newspaper, which is really unfortunate because things like school board, information and city council races and stuff like that, what will happen in places like Guthrie, they just won't get covered. Yeah, we'll Piedmont, they that. had to open like a, a Piedmont page on uh -huh. Facebook so that way people, so people. Yeah, because we used to have, I mean, they can sell the tickets at, but like, we used to be like three times a week, it's two times a week because another paper opened and they kind of cost right. each other business. So yeah, they haven't gone online yet. They have, there's a, the Guthrie News uh, page is, I think, about to go broke. There is a, a guy in Guthrie who's put on, and he's, he's making a little bit of money. He's kind of an entrepreneur. He's got, got something called the Guthrie News page, which is online. But the quality of, I mean, they actually used to have, when I was vice mayor in Guthrie, there were actually reporters that came and actually, you know, reported on the city council and the school board meeting and the uh, county commission meeting, and they just don't really do that much anymore. Um, he gets this guy who does the Guthrie news page. He gets sort of what you can get from like the police reports and stuff like that, but they don't really cover a lot of what's actually. They they'll publish the agenda from the city council meeting. Well, that doesn't tell you a whole lot, uh, you know, what's actually going on. So the future of newspapers, I think, is really uncertain. I think what you'll see is you'll see a consolidation, a lot more going online, um, but it means that a lot of that local stuff won't be covered. I mean, there you know they used to cover things. Local papers covered things like family reunions, and that was kind of a big deal in small towns like Guthrie, which is, that's no longer um, being covered. All right, so on Thursday, we will have the second exam. It will cover chapters 7 through 12. Um, 25 easy, breezy, beautiful questions. Fair and balanced, just like Fox News, similar to the last one. And somebody got bonus points today, didn't they? They were answering the Vogue question. Is that 